Funding for Frontline is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight on Frontline, a blood feud between a radical group and city officials leaves 11 people dead. As a mayor of the city, I accept full and total responsibility for decisions made. A black neighborhood is destroyed, and 61 innocent families are left homeless. What is it, a crime to be black in this country? Tonight, the bombing of West Philly. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTBS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Two years ago this month, the Philadelphia police, attempting to arrest members of a radical group called MOVE, dropped a bomb on a West Philadelphia row house. Eleven people were killed, 250 people were left homeless. Tonight, our inquiry into the crisis. We ask what happened and who was responsible. We should note that the mayor of Philadelphia has refused to talk to Frontline, as have police and fire department officials. Our program is called The Bombing of West Philly. It is reported by Leon Dash and produced for Frontline by Martin Smith. And I must warn you, this program contains graphic language and scenes of violence. What is it, a crime to be black in this country? I mean, is, is, it a penalty? is this the penalty for being black in this country? I mean, is Mayor Good, does he, does he forget that, that he was once a, a, a black person too? Did he forget what uh, 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 the struggle about freedom is all about? I don't know. I don't know where he lost his roots, but I tell you one thing: he better go back and get him. We call it institutionalized racism, and that's exactly what it was. Because we were black, and because the the the, the institution has a way of handling black people, you understand? Understand through the system. You understand? It didn't matter whether Wilson Good was black or whether Wilson Good was white. It's the institution. It's the governmental institution. This is the way we handle black people. To sacrifice us to cover up their mess was not fair. I didn't do anything to these people. I didn't do anything. All I wanted was help. And just to strip me of my happiness was not right was not fair. Where is the justice? Where? This is a story about a feud between the Philadelphia police and a radical group called MOVE. A feud that spanned over 10 years and took the lives of one police officer, six MOVE adults, and five children. A feud that city leaders allowed to disrupt and finally destroy a neighborhood. This is the story of how it happened and who was to blame. As a mayor of the city, I accept full and total responsibility for decisions made to in fact go in and to evacuate the Osage Avenue house. I stand behind those persons who made those decisions. I support my commissioners, I support my managing director, and I want the people of the city to judge me by that decision. A little over a month after the May 13, 1985 confrontation, Mayor Good appointed a commission to investigate the incident. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Over 140 hours of hearings included testimony from the mayor, the city's managing director, the police commissioner and the fire commissioner. That you wanted to act in a comprehensive fashion. In its final report, the commission cited the mayor for abdication of responsibility and gross negligence. We have to remember that this nation fought wars to prevent bombs from being dropped on its people in this country. 
and we sit by and allow a little city government to borrow a helicopter and concoct a bomb with high military explosives, C4, and drop it on our people? What kind of people are we? That's the issue. When they begin to charge us, when they begin to throw stuff, you have we're to. going to take them on. Yes, okay? you have to. I understand. The origins of the MOVE confrontation date back to the 60s and 70s, when Philadelphia, under police chief and eventually mayor Frank Rizzo, tolerated a police force with one of America's worst records for brutality. This is MOVE, when this is 309 North 33rd. MOVE is a totally revolutionary organization, and the purpose of MOVE is to uh, exhibit by its activity the purpose of revolution. The young blacks and some whites who joined MOVE came of age in this era, and they vowed to destroy the system under which they grew up. Their leader and founder was Vincent Leapart, alias John Africa, a freelance handyman who advocated the abolition of all man-made laws. In the early 1970s, about 30 MOVE members lived in a two-story house in the Powelton Village area of West Philadelphia. Move's philosophy called for lots of exercise, a raw food diet, and rejection of all technology. The policemen who confronted Move found them difficult to understand. These these people are just neurotic. I mean, uh, they're it's like insane. There there was no principle. There was no nothing behind them. They nobody even know what it meant. Move. I mean, uh, they still don't. And. Um, so uh, somebody said they got it because when they were kids growing up, every time they seen a cop, he'd say, move. So they called themselves move. I mean, I don't know how they got it. I want to put out one thing. Like, you may hear me use profanity, but it is impossible to describe a maniac, a profane, obscene, pornographic freak without using a profane word. Profanity was their biggest weapon. Demonstrations like this protest in front of a Philadelphia police precinct inevitably led to arrests. You have to understand that Moves selected the time and the date and the place when they were going to get arrested. They decided that today is an activity, we're going to get arrested, and we go out and we protest and we do this and that, and who's going to get arrested and whatever have you. Charles Patton was a Philadelphia police officer until 1984. As he told frontline correspondent Leon Dash, arresting MOVE members only passed the problem to the courts. MOVE literally, I believe, tied the court system up. Just a mere fact, we locked them up for failure to disperse, right, and disorderly conduct. When they went into the court system, as a result of their actions, calling the judge misfit MF, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., uh, the judge held them in contempt of court. Now, we may only locked up a few of them. But then the spectators in the audience of other MOVE supporters and other MOVE members, they would disrupt the court. Now the judge, in turn, would hold maybe uh, six or seven or eight or nine or maybe even ten of them in contempt of court. So you have one person on trial and end up with maybe ten being held in contempt. What we do, we go to court and we start sounding the judge. The judge, the judge would come in, the court bailiff would say, all rise. And the first thing everybody sees is us sitting there. Delbert Africa, a former Black Panther, joined MOVE in 1972. Okay. Understand, MOVE went to court with a confrontation unit. This is what we called it, because not everybody went to court uh, or got arrested, okay? We went to court with a confrontation unit of, at most, 15 people, all right? Those 15 people had a total of over 800 and something cases, over well over uh, millions of dollars of bail, and it didn't take... No whole lot of us. Like I say, it wasn't but 15. Can you imagine that example? If everybody went to court and said, I don't care what you do, give me contempt. So what? I have just as much right, and my brother got just as much right to speak as you. So what you doing arrogantly gaveling us down? Delbert practiced his courtroom tactics in move mock trials. What you understand is our freedom is in jeopardy, and we will do anything to protect that freedom. You cannot put any restrictions on our freedom. Mr. Africa, this is not a forum for your political views. What is it? Do you understand that? Do you understand that I was brought here because of my beliefs, because of my views? So obviously this is a forum for it. Your Honor, 
I object. I think the witness at this point is, uh, is badgering the judge. In March 1976, one incident triggered a rapid escalation of hostility between Move and the city. Move claims the police killed one of their babies. Delbert and Jerry Ford Africa were there. This baby was murdered. It had, you know, been beat on the head with the sticks when the, when the cop was trying to beat Janine down. All right. And to, see, to have that happen, I think it, it resolved uh, Move members to the point where it said, we ain't backing up. We felt at that particular point that our organization had to make a statement to the city, to the world, that we were no longer going to tolerate the abuse and uh, the, the killing of our membership. We contacted city officials, state officials, everybody, complain, you know, look what you've done. I agreed to go uh, because I, I wanted to help them. Councilman Lucian you know. Blackwell was one of several city leaders invited over to the move house. We ate, and that, uh, we were just about finished when Delbert Africa had a, read a note. He, 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 he started to circulate a note. And when it got to me, I read it, and he said, the baby has arrived. It was then I, that I started to suspect something. And we went upstairs in one of the empty rooms. And there was what appeared to be the body of a dead baby in a, in, a, in, a, in a box. We didn't touch it. We didn't get close to it. We, didn't have it. we couldn't turn the lights up. There were no lights in there. So it, it could have been a baby. It might not have been a, been a baby. But according to them, it was a baby. Uh, I then, Councilman Blackwell pressed uh, the city to investigate uh, the incident. But the city never took action. Over the next year, MOVE grew more militant. On May 20th, 1977, they showed up on their front porch armed with rifles and handguns. The city set up 24-hour surveillance. It was the beginning of a 14-month-long standoff. If the police come in here with their hands, we'll, we'll use our hands. If they come in here with clubs, we'll use clubs. But if they come in here shooting and killing our women and children and our men, we will shoot back in defense of our lives. When I finally saw him on the porch, you know, I did some soul searching as to, you know, what is this all about now? Because certain things were taking place and I thought I was knowledgeable of what MOVE was doing, what they were all about and stuff. And all of a sudden, they appear on the porch with the guns and so forth. Because all in the past, they spoke on a peaceful revolution type thing and confronting the system in a peaceful manner. Uh, after the gun thing, I kind of say, hey, you know, it's a new ball game now. We didn't know the consequences of what we were doing in terms of spelling out step by step what it would be. We had a belief that everything would work out, okay? And we knew that day that we came up on that platform with them guns, that it would bring everything to the forefront. Because the city had been beating and killing us all along. But this demonstration would make it so that they couldn't do it in secret no more. We're going to put the blockade in. We're going to shut off all utilities. There'll be not a fly gets through. After many months and $3 million worth of police overtime, Mayor Rizzo tried to starve Move out. But Move held fast. Ultimately, the blockade failed. So did attempts to negotiate a surrender. We're not about surrender. To surrender is to say we're guilty. We're not guilty. We're innocent. Many people now saw Move as victims of a racist city government. Mayor Rizzo watched as Move gained community support. Then, on August 8, 1978, the mayor, convinced nothing else would work, sent in the police. It would be the first full-scale confrontation between Move and the city. The police will be in there to drag them out by the backs of their necks. There will be a confrontation this time. Well, there will be no barricades. I don't know. It's up to them whether there's no barricades, Mike. They're going to be taken by force if they resist. No question about that. Children or not. Uh, some supporters uh, came around to our house early in the morning saying, hey, man, the police is uh, 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 massing around the corner. They're coming up. Uh, we all throughout the house were uh, awake. Uh, we gathered everybody together, the kids, children, and uh, we rushed on down to the basement uh, to, to prepare for them coming.
Well, when we got there, uh, we uh, moved into position. Uh, the ultimatums were given. The, uh, the uh, barricades were knocked down. The front porch was knocked down. The front window, basement window on 33rd Street was exposed. And uh, I was right next to the window. The window being right here, I was to the wall. Two of them now. Two dirty guns. Oh, they're shooting. Oh, they're shooting. They are. They fired first. They definitely fired first and fired a lot of sustained fire. It wasn't, uh, the police didn't fire back uh, until given the orders to fire back. Because it, what they were doing was they, they were just, abs well, they, they were scrambling. <laughs> The car. One police officer lay dead. Four other policemen and four firemen were wounded. Move claims they never fired a shot. I know the cops fired the shots throughout the whole thing. Ain't no doubt about it. Ain't no doubt about it. We didn't fire. Who killed Officer Ramp? One of them cops. And that's why they want to cover it up. That's why they want to cover under the Rizzo regime right then and there. Ain't no way in the world he would admit that his hand-picked Gestapo had shot each other to death. But then frantic cops admitted that they were shooting off rounds all, all throughout there, all right? Gunfire was going off for five, ten minutes, all right? Uh, one cop, he's now FOP president, Bob Hurst, he admitted that he looked through our window, saw a group of women and children. He said women and children, unarmed, and he emptied his damn carbine at them. Delbert, uh, Africa, yesterday told me that you had seen some um, women and children through the basement window and then emptied your carbine rifle into through that window. No, absolutely not. Delbert knows better than that. What I seen was Chucky Africa. Seen him clearly coming right up to the window. And I seen him with that uh, Mini Ruger 223 and I said that. And that's what I seen. The only time I seen the women and children is at the time they were coming out of the window. When it was all over, I never seen the <clears throat> women and children in there. You could hear them. The Delbert's right on that. I mean, I knew they were in there. Were you afraid that you could hit any of the women and children? There was a possibility. How did sure. you feel about the possibility? Well, I didn't like that possibility at all. I mean, I don't like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't like that. But I don't know who's firing back at me either. I mean, you don't know what's in the opposite end of that opposite end of that barrel. You just don't know. So you have to neutralize any adversary. Any adversary has to be neutralized. A group of people came out, there was a pause, then the last of us went out. And I myself, I was trying to go out the front along with everybody else. When a cop in the back window uh, put his gun at my head and said, bring your ass out here. And I looked and I dug, I had no other choice. So I come out on the side on Pearl Street and uh, that's when the cops jumped up and down and on my head, in my groin, the whole bit, right in front of international TV, okay? And these are the same cops that tried to say, I come out of their arm. Hitting him on the head. Hit, kicking him on the head. I have no idea. I just couldn't see. Shut up! As far as Delbert Africa and the frustrations of those police officers and having their leader come out there as defiant as he did after having slaughtered our own people and then expect a society to turn around where no emotion, you strip it, you're, they're sterile, and you're not supposed to touch the guy. 
It's a wonder the man ever walked. How in God's name can anybody just say, well, treat him properly, forget it, emotions are free, don't do anything, pick up your dead, pick up all your wounded, walk away, everything's okay, he did his thing, but it's okay, you don't do your thing. Well, you can put a badge on all day long, but you still have a little blood pumping in you. You still have the emotion and the frustration of seeing your own people slaughtered. And then this thing comes out here like a milk-fed quarterback, and, and, he, and he wants to be a, a star? A star? I'd have buried him. I'd have buried him. He killed somebody who he couldn't carry his jockstrap. A 30-year Marine, two wars, all the blood and everything else that this man saved in the streets of Philadelphia, and that garbage, that trash, because he had a cause that he couldn't even spell, wants to just blow everybody away and come out and say, I got rights. Got rights? He's got to be mad. I know he's mad anyway. Three officers who beat Delbert Africa were indicted and tried for assault. A Philadelphia judge found them innocent. Delbert and eight other MOVE members were convicted of murder. Each was sentenced to 30 to 100 years in state prison. Over the next few years, MOVE disappeared. It was not until three years later that some fugitive MOVE members were discovered living in Rochester, New York. John Africa was one of them. He and the others had fled Philadelphia before the August 8th confrontation. Federal and local prosecutors in Philadelphia hoped they could put MOVE away forever. They did not succeed. MOVE sympathizers are celebrating the acquittal of their leader, Vincent Leapheart, also known as John Africa. Leapheart was asked how he felt when the verdict was read. Nothing. I was asleep. What are your plans in terms of staying in Philadelphia, in terms of trying to uh, yeah, continue the MOVE cult? It's not a cult. It's an organization. Okay, what are your plans? After the trial, MOVE members not in prison took up residence in a black middle-class neighborhood a couple of miles from their Powelton Village shootout. All was quiet for the first couple of years. But in the summer of 1983, a second MOVE confrontation started to take shape. Our first confrontation with the MOVE people really came about with the children. First, the neighbors complained about children eating out of their garbage cans and about stray dogs, roaches, and smell. And trash, and uh, the animals were back there, and uh, in the summertime they had raw meat back there. And there were also stories of verbal and physical attacks. Mo Africa, he ran and punched me in the back of my head. The neighbors expected the city to act. Threatened to kill my 17-year-old son. They threatened me, said... Uh, what did they say they were going to do right. you? They said they were going to kick my door in, rape my wife, and kill my children. This city did nothing to stop these people. And All they, they got up, were promises. They told us what we wanted to hear, the city officials. We will take care of this problem. Don't worry about it. Let's don't get nothing going until Mary Good gets elected. All of us, from all neighborhoods, from all walks of life, white, black. Wilson Good was Philadelphia's first black mayor. His election seemed to signal a departure from the past. Working together can solve the problem facing our city. Black neighborhoods that had been politically written off had reason to be optimistic. MOVE had different ideas. A few weeks before Good's inauguration, they boarded up their house and mounted a bullhorn outside. It was Christmas Eve, 1983. And I went to bed, and uh, about one o'clock I thought, I said, oh my gosh, I got a rowdy block, child. you know, I got a rowdy block. And you could hear voices, but then I opened the window, and the first thing I heard was MF Santa Claus. I said, what did I? It was MF Santa Claus. Why did MOVE harass the neighbors on Osage Avenue? 
Why did MOVE harass the neighbors in Osage Avenue? First of all, we did not harass the neighbors on Osage Avenue. I met with them last night, some of them, about 20 of them, and they said that you harassed them. Well, Beginning, I... essentially, uh, in a major confrontation on Christmas Eve, 1983, by setting up a bullhorn and announcing MOVE's position to the neighborhood for hours on end, keeping the children away, and also subjecting their children to profane language, which they objected to. Okay, now, you finished with that? Yes. Okay, first of all, the, what took place on December um, 24th, 1984, was, 1983. 1983, was a confrontation that MOVE had initiated against the city of Philadelphia. Concerning the, uh, the use of the bullhorn and the use of profanity, well, it's unfortunate that our confronting the system in the way that we did was to impose on their rights, but certainly it wasn't. In fact, it was to ensure them. I went over to the move house and talked with uh, Frank James and uh, Conrad and Teresa and Ron to Africa about uh, what their reason was to have all of this uh, confusion on our block. They said, well, we are trying to get our people who are in jail unjustly because of the Powhatan Village uh, incident uh, in 1978. They said, we want to get them released. They said, if we make you angry enough as residents, as our neighbors, then City Hall has got to respond. What led to the neighbors' complaints is the position that we took, that we have innocent people in prison and we want them out and our demonstrations to get our people out of prison. We talked on the loudspeaker, yes we did. We told people that we were pushed to take the position that we're taking, that if they wanted to do something to eliminate the situation, to relieve it in some way, that they should be down City Hall complaining. We encourage people to go down City Hall and complain. They said, uh, we're going to put pressure on you until you put pressure on City Hall and uh, make them let our people go. On Memorial Day of 1984, 15 Osage Avenue residents went down to City Hall to meet with the mayor. When we had a meeting with the mayor, we all went out there. I know right then in my heart, I knew there wasn't nothing he, he was going to do for us. Because he said to us, why can't you all deal with it? It's black on black. He didn't want to deal with us at all. He had just like we was a bunch of bombs sitting there, and he was talking to a bunch of bombs. That's the I feeling you got. That's the feeling I got, and I, I think we all got that same feeling. That he was talking down to you. Yes. Right. He didn't even want to talk to us. We were wasting his time. We were wasting his time that Sunday morning. I don't know how to solve a problem at this point. I cannot, as mayor of the city, uh, take an illegal action in order to begin to deal with the concerns of a block. I sense very early that we did not have the expertise to do what had to be done. At hearings held to investigate the city's handling of the 1985 MOVE confrontation, city officials described how the city dealt with neighbors' complaints. Did you yourself or through your committee bring it to the attention of other agencies? No, we did not. Was this just too hot to handle? I think that's a good summary for it, sir. Mr. White, if this was too hot to handle, uh, what help was available to those neighbors? Mr. Bowser, if the, I wish si if the city couldn't help them, who could? Well, you're, uh, you're saying the city, uh, you're asking me. I'm, I'm obviously not communicating, and I'm Mr. White, I don't want to prolong this. Did you call anybody up and say, look, we got a bad problem out on no. Osage Avenue? No, I did not. And someone had better do something no, about it? No, I did not. It? Failure to respond to neighborhood complaints was that part of a policy of avoidance, house, even when the mayor was informed well, that outstanding that warrants on some MOVE members justified MOVE making arrests, the, the mayor chose to avoid confrontation. Therefore, I did not see uh, that going in and making arrests of two, three people on misdemeanor charges would in fact solve the problem and would in fact do nothing more than aggravate the problem and make the problem worse. With the city not taking action, MOVE continued to put pressure on the neighbors. 
in the fall of 1984, they went so far as to construct a fortified bunker on their roof, complete with gun portals and a new and larger bullhorn. This is unreal. I, I, you know, they have to deal with this, you know. And at that point, Cliff and, and us got together. We're going to have a news conference. Then we're going to do something. We've got to get bats and guns and do something our damn selves because we were fed up by that point. Enough was enough. We had waited a whole year and watched them build this stupid bunker up there. You know, I mean, dragging logs and trees all the park up the street to fortify this place and nobody done anything. With the police right there, 24 hours a day, watching everything that goes on. Is it a confrontation? It most certainly is a confrontation, one strategized by Giant Africa years and years and years ago. There's been talk that there are explosives in this house. Uh, is there any truth to that? That's only people's, uh, you know, hallucination because they have not been inside this house, so they would not know what is in this house. What is in this house is the strategy of John Africa that is very explosive. In the spring of 1985, the neighbors, fed up, called upon the governor of Pennsylvania for help. Mayor Good was forced to take action. Like Mayor Rizzo before him, he turned the matter over to the police. The final point I gave to the police commissioner was... Uh, uh, take your time, uh, prepare a good plan. We can then uh, proceed uh, with a tremendous amount of order. On Mother's Day, May 12th, the police evacuated the neighborhood and told residents they could return in 24 hours. But I was told to leave because you don't know what the extent of this is going to be, you know? What do you think? I, I think, believe it or not, I think you'll have to kill all of them. We want them out, and I feel that uh, whatever has to be done, has to be done. Whatever means are necessary, and that's what I want. Uh, Tom, this is Harvey. Uh, look for Sam Bohr and company. They just have come in. By early Monday morning, May 13th, there were 500 policemen surrounding the house. Some of them had confronted MOVE before, in 1978. This time, they came more heavily armed. At 5.35 a.m., the police gave four MOVE members named in arrest warrants 15 minutes to surrender. The police believed there were at least six adults and as many as 12 children in the house. When MOVE refused to surrender, the police opened up with tear gas, smoke, and water cannons. Gunfire lasted for 90 minutes. Move wasn't surrendering. The mayor was not on the scene. He relied on TV news and telephone reports from his second in command, city managing director Leo Brooks, a former U.S. Army general. Brooks knew little about what was going on. You could, I assume, from your command post, or at least when you went outside, hear gunfire. 
Oh, absolutely. Did it sound to you like automatic gunfire? Oh, absolutely. Uh, did you know prior to hearing the automatic gunfire that the police would be in possession of and possibly using automatic weapons? I knew they would have M16s. Did you know they'd have Uzis? I did not. Did you know they'd have uh, 50 caliber uh, weapons present? I, I did not. Okay. Did you know that they'd have an anti-tank gun? I did not. Did you know they'd have an M60? I did not. While Brooks was supposedly in charge, the mayor was at home with some local politicians who he'd invited over to help him monitor the morning's events. From the mayor's kitchen, they could hear the gunfire. I arrived about 4.30 along with uh, President Coleman, uh, city council. Uh, Hart, I met State Senator Hardy Williams and uh, uh, State Representative Pete Truman. We sat there with the mayor uh, for a long time, with the mayor at periodically uh, turning us and saying everything's all right, nobody's hurt. Uh, uh, one time he said that uh, they're not firing in the house in response to the fact that we were a little, a little worried about hearing the gunfire and rapid gunfire, which sounded like automatic weapons, uh, and said that they're firing over the house but not in the house. At any time during that morning, uh, did Mr. Brooks report to you whether or not police were returning fire at the house or were shooting above the house? My understanding from one conversation I had that morning was that the police uh, were shooting above the house. The mayor was misinformed. The police fired at least 10,000 rounds, not over, but into the house. At the same time, police assault teams were using powerful explosives. You understood they were going to use explosives that would only put three inch holes in the wall. Yes. When was the first time you learned, sir, that uh, explosives had uh, pretty much blown off the front of the house of, uh, of the porch area of 6221? Sometime subsequent to May 13th. Okay. And how did you learn that? Uh, from reading uh, news accounts. Are you positive that you told the mayor that you were going to use explosive charges? Yes, sir, I did. Did the mayor seem to you to be paying attention to what you were saying? Yes, sir. Did because he, he asked me if it was safe. After a morning of gunfire and explosions, a 10-hour standoff followed. The police had prepared no backup plan. With move holding fast, the police discussed alternatives, but did not consult any of the city's trained crisis negotiators. Meanwhile, the mayor went down to City Hall and in mid-afternoon held a press conference. We intend to uh, evict from the house, we intend to evacuate from the house, and we intend to seize control of the house. Uh, we, will, we will do it by any means necessary. Mayor, do you have any plans? Uh, we don't have any plans beyond, uh, at this time, Russell, beyond taking control of the house. Do you have any plans to go to the scene to go to Osage Avenue? Uh, no, I think it's inappropriate for the executive to be there. I have two, uh, three very capable people there, Leo Brooks, Managing Director, Greg Sanboy, the Police Commissioner, and Bill Richmond, the Fire Commissioner. I don't think I'm needed at the scene. But are you saying, Mayor, I want to understand you correctly, are you saying that if we, Commissioner Sanboy can do anything he wants at this point, that you will not say yay or nay either way? I'm saying to you that the Police Commissioner is Police Commissioner, and he's in charge of police operations, and that he will be, in fact, listened to in terms of how he wants to proceed. At five in the afternoon, a new plan was conceived. I told the mayor that it was going to be difficult to secure that area during the night, that the neighbors were clamoring to return to their homes, and that the, that, uh, that, uh, the commissioner wanted to drop a device on the roof to destroy the bunker and penetrate the roof. After he said to me he was going to blow the bunker off, I paused, uh, I guess, for 30 seconds to absorb what he was saying to me. Uh, and the next word I said to him was, um, does Mr. Sambor know about this? Uh, he says, yes, it was his idea. This, in my estimation, was the best way to go. Did the managing director concur in your decision to 
uh, used the helicopter to drop the explosive? Yes, sir. Did he then call the mayor? He did. Did you tell the mayor that it was going to be dropped from a helicopter? I, I, I did. And you recall yesterday that he testified that his recollection differed? Yes. Are you positive you told him that it was going to be dropped from a helicopter? I'm positive. Director Brooks' uh, understanding of that conversation uh, differs from mine uh, somewhat in that he recalls having said to me that they were going to use a helicopter to do this. Uh, that is not my recollection. <laughs> At 5.27 p.m., without warning move, a bomb containing powerful military explosives was dropped. Expecting move to flee, police stakeout teams took up positions in the alley behind the house. T. O'Brien from Channel 3 came in. She said, Lucian, what's going on? I said, well, we've got an impasse, nothing. She said, oh, no, Lucian, we just heard an explosion out there. We turned on this television here, and... We saw the helicopter circling, and we saw the fellow drop the bomb, and boom. Uh, I, I, I stood there and watched, and at first, uh, you know, I was, while I was concerned, uh, I felt that they had, in, had this thing under control, and they figured, well, maybe they're trying to smoke them out. You know, they figured if enough smoke filled up the house that, that they would run out in the street and they would probably capture them. Then after a while, we, start, we, saw, the, uh, we saw the fire. We went down, we saw the mayor. And he was, he was coming out of his office, and I said, hey, you know, he said, everything's under control. He said, we have it under control. Don't worry about it. Everything's all right. There was still no sign that move would leave the house. The police and fire commissioners now agreed to use the fire as a tactical weapon. Commissioner Sambor said to me, uh, something to the effect, can we control that fire? And my response, and I'm a cautious person by nature, I said, I think we can. He said, let's let the bunker burn. I did tell him, in, in essence, in communication, I communicated to him that I would like to let the fire burn. I mean, the bunker burn. Why didn't you get Mr. Brooks on the phone and say, put out the fire? I did. When? At 6 o'clock. How about at 6.30 and 7 and 7.30 and 8 and 8.30 as we all watched the television? We talked about that. Throughout the evening, uh, and we kept calling back and saying, uh, what's going on? Why can't you put the fire out? And the mayor said, I'm looking at the television. The fire, that fire is getting hotter. I mean, it's getting larger. Put that fire out. And I said, I, ju I just finished talking to the commissioner, told him to put the fire out. After that order was given to put the fire out, to turn the water on, uh, did you convey that order to anyone else? Yes, sir. To whom? Fire commissioner was still there. I categorically deny that. I had no knowledge of an order from General Brooks to extinguish that fire. An hour after the fire started, the bunker fell into the second floor. According to one of the survivors, a child named Birdie Africa, move women and children were huddled under wet blankets in a basement garage while a police video crew took these pictures. Over the next hour, the fire moved down through the house and began to spread to adjacent homes. It wasn't until 90 minutes after the fire started that MOVE members tried to escape. At that time, witnesses heard gunshots coming from the back alley. Your first attempt to get out of the garage, you turned back because of the gunfire, right? That's right. What was happening? Were the, could you hear the bullets around you? Yeah, I could hear them very distinctly. I could hear them hitting all around the house, all around me. Some shooting started. Could you hear shooting? Mm. What did it sound like? It was a do -do 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 like that. Police gunfire forced Move to stay in the house. Move made another attempt to escape about 10 minutes later. 
This time, Ramona says, there was no shooting. As soon as I thought that I didn't hear that type of fire anymore, we tried to get out again. That's when we started yelling at kids coming out, and, they, and then they opened the garage door. I know they heard us. I know they heard us. We were saying, we want to come out. And what did the other children do? Did they do the same thing? Yeah. Were any of the children crying? Yeah, we all were. Then what happened? And Mona went out, and then, then she said, um, it's all right, we got to come out now. And then we started rushing out. Other members followed you out. That's right. How many? I don't know how many exactly. I know it was several people that came out. So Mona was out, was she the first one out? Mm-hmm. And then who, who was out next? Tree. Tree. And then, then who went out? Phil. Phil. Me. And then who went out? Me. I'm saying I know that more, more than uh, Birdie and I was outside of that house, and there is no reason in the world for me to believe that anybody would voluntarily just, you know, go back into a house and stay there. What did Phil and Tree do? They was running. She told them to run. Which way did they run? Down the alley. Were they down the alley towards uh, Cobbs Creek or down the alley towards uh, 62nd? Cobbs Creek. Towards Cobbs Creek. Did you see them running down the alley? I don't remember really how many went toward uh, Cobbs Creek, but um, we got to cut this out. I'm going to talk about this some more. Did you ever see a tree of Phil again? <laughs> Birdie and Ramona were taken into police custody rushed to nearby hospitals and treated for burns. Police had notified the hospital to expect two other children. They never arrived. Soon after the escape, houses rapidly caught fire across Osage Avenue and behind the alley. A total of 61 homes burned down before the fire was declared under control at a quarter to midnight. At a press conference three days later, reporters asked about gunshots behind the house. The police commissioner gave them two versions of what happened. First, he claimed his officers fired shots in self-defense at a moved man with a rifle. Uh, fire was returned as for the fact as to whether or not we killed anybody. That information is not at this present available to me. Later in the same press conference, the commissioner reversed his story. Let me, clear one, let me clear one thing up to the question about the firing in the alley. About what? About the return or the alleged return of fire by the stakeout officers against the people in the alley. There was no fire returned by the police officers for fear of hitting the child. If anyone knows for certain what happened in the back alley, they have not yet come forward. The accounts of Bertie and Ramona, that they saw others running from the house, are unexplained. All 11 bodies were reportedly found within the house walls. This is the body of 
John Africa. But there is other evidence. A pathologist found bullet fragments in three moved bodies. Because the fire partially consumed some of the bodies recovered, evidence of other gunshot wounds was possibly destroyed. Also, witnesses heard automatic weapons fired at the time of the escape, gunfire that could only have come from the police. In the ruins of the move house, police search teams found only the remains of two pistols, a 22 caliber rifle, and a shotgun. Move had no automatic weapons. There are also questions concerning when the mayor gave the order to put the fire out. Re-examination of the facts indicates that the order may have come much later than the mayor claims. Why didn't you get Mr. Brooks on the phone and say, put out the fire? I did. When? At 6 o'clock. According to the mayor, his order to extinguish the fire was given at around 6 o'clock, at a time when the fire was still easily controllable. Then the mayor testified, seeing on live television, water immediately turned on the fire. But according to fire department logs and TV videotapes, water was not turned on to the move house until 6.30. That places the mayor's order a critical half hour later than he claims. By then, the fire was raging out of control. And despite the mayor's initial order, the water was soon turned off. Firemen, deferring to the police, did not fight the fire in any conventional way until after 9.30. Had the mayor's order been given and followed at 6, 11 lives and 61 homes might have been saved. We pleaded, we begged to come in and solve a difficult problem that is getting worse and worse and worse. Way before you made the decision to drop a damn bomb on my house. You ruined my life, and here I am sitting, can't go back to my house behind the bullshit these people down here trying to put. They didn't come in here with no sensitivity to anybody. They didn't care. They sent people over there to try to clean up a mess that they made over there. And we're just supposed to take anything from these people. This is what they expect us to do. They don't care about us. They say, well, let them suffer, let them rot. It's not for a, a day or a week, but for years and years. And we go down and, 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 and approach the mayor about some solution. And, and what he says, well, we're working on it. We don't know exactly what to do. He, wait, wait, wait. And then he take all the time to try to make a decision. And what does he do? Comes in and says, okay, attack the house. Fire 10,000 rounds of ammunition, talking about he's interested in protecting the kids. What kind of protection of kids when you fire 10,000 rounds of ammunition in there? And when they let the bunker, they decided physically, decided to let the bunker burn. They knew they was going to burn down the whole neighborhood. Who gave them people that power? And if they let them get away with it this time, guess what? They'll have another neighborhood burnt down, another black neighborhood burnt down. And that's what these people better understand out here that are listening to us tonight. I'm bitter. I'm very, very bitter, and, and I make no bones about it, and I don't care where chips fall, because I know one thing, if it would ever happen in a white neighborhood, they would have snuffed it out right in the beginning. I don't know what else I can say other than, Mr. Roof, I'm sorry. That wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. Yeah. The question is, we have to find if somebody made mistakes. Mr. Roof? And I didn't hear that today, and that's, that's what I'm I'm sorry, sir. Uh, would you repeat your question? I mean... We have to write a report that says whether or not someone or some people or some leaders made mistakes and assess responsibility. And we have to go off and do that. That's all. Uh, is your question, sir, whether or not uh, you feel... I think you've answered my question, yeah. sir. I really do. The, 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 the answer to your question is that, yes, uh, I made mistakes in this process. Ms. Ruth, if I may. Soon after the fire, Mayor Good's managing director Brooks resigned. A few months later, Police Commissioner Sambor retired. Fire Commissioner Richmond and Mayor Good remained in office. Ramona Africa was tried and sentenced to up to seven years in prison for riot and conspiracy. 
His position was that he The child, Birdie Africa, now lives with his father, who never was a MOVE member. Birdie's mother died in the fire. There are presently two grand jury investigations, one local, one federal, into the events of May 13, 1985. A decision by the local grand jury to hand down possible criminal indictments is due soon. A third grand jury has been impaneled to investigate construction delays and cost overruns in the rebuilding of the neighbors' houses. After waiting over a year, most residents returned to Osage Avenue last fall. Please join us again for Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. The pain and isolation of emotional illness. See, I'm mentally ill. I'm hard of hearing and I'm different. See, I got all that on me. Mental illness strikes one out of five American adults. How do these people feel about their lives? Little kids laugh at me, think I'm a clown. That hurts. Watch A Matter of the Mind, next time on Frontline. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Frontline was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Schools, colleges, and other organizations interested in purchasing or renting video cassettes of this program may call 800 424 7963 or write PBS Video, Post Office Box 8092, Washington, D.C. 20024. <laughs>